We know AMR is a huge challenge. We've read the, the O'Neill Commission. We have Dame Sally with us here today. Um, keeping this momentum, keeping a spotlight on the, the uh, issue, but also figuring out ways in which we can have collaborative action to deal with this is going to be uh, hugely important. This is a firm part of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, and a clear recognition that to make progress against all those goals is going to take public and private action and collaboration. So that's a big feature of what we're doing here. 700,000 a year it's modelled, and that's mainly um, the biggest component is TB. But we have to remember the people who die of drug-resistant malaria, of drug-resistant HIV, as well as bacteria. So at the moment, you could argue it's not a very big problem. I would argue for those 700,000 families, it is a sad problem, and many of them will have lost either the mother or the wage earner. And if you look in India, losing 60,000 babies every year from infections that are drug resistant, that surely in this modern world should be unacceptable. For me, it is. Diagnostics can and must be a critical component in any approach to help reduce the threat of antimicrobial resistance. They can be used to identify, monitor, track, and prevent resistance and improve the judicious use of antibiotics. They can help to rule out bacterial infection and avoid inappropriate antibiotic therapy, reducing the spread of resistance. They can identify the specific organism responsible for an infection and guide patient therapy to the most targeted and appropriate antibiotic. By identifying drug-resistant organisms, diagnostic tests can enable isolation, decontamination, and reduction of resistant infections. And in point-of-care settings, tests can provide rapid results that speed diagnosis and enable more efficient delivery of appropriate care. To fully leverage the power of diagnostic tests in the fight against antimicrobial resistance, their potential and use must be well understood by all stakeholders. Today. So it's no coincidence that we are here in Davos talking about drug resistance bugs and saving lives. Many of you may know that in the mid-19th century, Davos was actually a sanatorium for TB patients. People came here to spend their last years in peace in the microclimate in the beautiful mountains. And today we still talk about TB, more virulent forms of the bacteria and the bug. Usually we are being perceived as providers, as manufacturers, and that's great, and we do research. No, we are part of the value, cha of the value chain of the expression of healthcare. Huh? And uh, that status is very fundamental to be recognized because uh, as we are recognized in such a way, we certainly become partners in ta in, into that uh, multiple partnership uh, dimension that must be core to the ambition that we have. No one alone will be able to deliver that ambition unless we are part of a network of partnerships. Tomorrow, I'm heading to Addis Ababa to be the first director of the Africa uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention which is a new public health agency that the continent uh, has created and will be officially launched by the head of states on uh, January 31st in Addis Ababa. And it will be an honor uh, to take on a task that most people have unanimously described as a, a great challenge, but exciting one, which I agree <laughs> with that. That will be, um, I'm looking forward to uh, assuming that responsibility uh, in the spirit of collaboration and partnership we really witness the problem of resistance. So for example, in malaria, what we see is that wherever we work, almost every child with a negative malaria rapid diagnostic test gets put on an antibiotic today. For TB, where we focused on lab strengthening for many years now, in India, for example, we still see that 80% of patients are not diagnosed with drug resistance. So for us, the AMR program is a natural outgrowth, basically. What excites me is that we finally have diagnostics on the agenda. And I think we heavily underestimate what we actually have. So I'm all for innovation. We also work in innovation. But we have to use what we have. And we are not good at that. And if we can't do it in highly resourced countries, we won't get there. And if we can't work together across country borders, we won't get there. Because we see each and every country wants to do their own studies, clinical studies, and there shouldn't be such a big difference in clinicals between different countries 
in Europe, as an example, there shouldn't be. The economical outcome shouldn't be so different. So if we can raise to that level that we can do more cross borders, raise it to a global level, then I think we can move it. And I'm just thinking that we are sitting here with a wonderful opportunity for the world to pull this together in a holistic way. Uh, I continue to be concerned that um, we will be forgotten. And uh, Sally, I take your challenge mm -hmm. that we, just need, we need to step this up. And I think we're quite uh, capable together uh, to do that. So I think this is a very, very e e exciting moment where we get to leverage the learnings from everything we've done in uh, HIV uh, as an industry and in TB, but we've got to take it to the next level so it's an integrated approach because commercialization and value is going to require that. We have to think of you know, a completely disruptive solution where regulatory authorities and, and uh, academia and departments of health need to come together around the same table and say, okay, let's look at the three A's, the trade-off between access, accuracy, and affordability, and assessing benefit and the risk at the same time, as well as think about reimbursement, etc. Why couldn't we sit around the same table to talk about this? When you can get the, the patients, the population, to understand, instead of the expectations that they have, that they only got a good treatment if they walked out with the prescription. Look at the Southern European countries. That's the attitude. That's what we need to change together with using the tools we have. I really want us to, uh, to learn a lot from the, the HIV experience. I think uh, Vince has touched on that. There are so many lessons we learned from HIV, but uh, two of those are that it's not because diagnostics are available that they are used appropriately. So assuming that you bring the price down to less than a dollar, assuming that your supply chain management works very well, assuming that the regulatory issues are there, you have, we currently have about 30 HIV rapid tests. Uh, but as uh, uh, Badara will tell us and others in the, from UNAIDS, 50% of the, those who are supposed to know their status don't even know, have not taken an HIV test, and we've been dealing with that for more than 30 years. So there's a big lesson to be learned there. For, there is a barrier there. It might be that people have no idea. Is Nigeria. You know, we discussed with the minister and the, the, all his department why people don't go to be diagnosed. Is it because they are poor? Is it because they don't know? Is it because they, this, whatever diagnosis tool is not accessible? It might be a combination, but that has to be in mind because we can have the best tool ever. If people don't access it, it's, it's an issue. Maybe part of the tension between industry and people who are calling for more affordable products is that this, we're not yet there on the simplification side. Um, and and I, think, I think that we can't fake that um, because um, without increased uh, simplification and really bringing some of the technology that can work in Switzerland and the UK, um, but doesn't, it's not very practical to use in um, sub-Saharan Africa and a lot of places. We're kind of starting to know that diagnostics are important, but it's not a focus. So we need some organization around this issue, um, some organized science, to get, and there is political demand for that, I think. So um, let's do that. Let's get organized. Let's publish something. And let's get some action. <laughs>